Okay, well, thank you all for coming. I've been looking forward to this day in that um, maybe my family's been looking forward to this day as well, so I'll, I'll stop talking about pain at home <laughs> and herbal approaches to pain. Um, so in this talk, what I'm going to do is cover the herbal management of pain and bring in you know, the science behind it, um, and there's a lot of interesting science that's happened here at sort of the University of California, Irvine, all over the world. Um, you know, what are the active ingredients in herbs? Um, and then I also want to bring in some of the Chinese um, and Native American sort of reasoning that goes into their more complex formulas, right? Because they're, you know, traditional herbalists are not um, looking for the active ingredient so much as trying to take a more holistic approach. So as you can see here, this is an apothecary. If you look around you, you see all the jars here. So, and you can see here, this is an apothecary. And I vowed one day to create an Asian medical clinic like the one that I worked in for three years in the Himalayas. I worked with the personal physician to the Dalai Lama, actually a woman. You don't hear too much about her because there's misogyny in India and Tibet just the way there is here. Um, she was the first female physician to His Holiness the Dalai Lama. So what happened is I started out in this field doing a master's in human biology at <coughs> Oxford University. And um, during that master's in human biology, I got very interested in Chinese and Tibetan herbal medicine. Um, but I was still a scientist. It helped me with eczema. I had started to meditate. Um, but of course, I was a scientist. And um, so I approached it as a scientist in my interest. And I applied to do a PhD at Oxford. And in the PhD, I expressed an interest to develop methodologies um, that could go into the field, like an anthropologist, and measure the efficacy of Tibetan medical treatments and Chinese medical treatments for arthritis, mental health. And in my proposal, of course, I found a lot of pharmaceutical scientific articles uh, where already uh, pharmaceutical companies had begun to plunder Asian medicine for its knowledge, right, and then profit off it. Um, but luckily, I could use that information to apply for a PhD. I got money, um, and most of that money came from the World Health Organization in Oxford. Um, so anyway, my pilot study started in 1991, and I thought it would be six weeks. That would be enough. Probably not go back. I don't know. But it really ended up being about six field periods of about six months, you know. And of course, I still go back when I can uh, because of family and friends there, or friends who have become family. So the apothecary here, uh, Tibetan medicine and Chinese medicine have herbal formulas that contain between about four and 30 different herbal ingredients. So if they're addressing a stomach problem, the chief herb will be sort of this very effective herb for nausea, say, right? But when you're when you're treating nausea, according to Asian medical doctors, um, you're, you're using a sort of violence to bring balance back, right? You're using a very strong herb to return the body to, an, to a non-nausea state. And so they then give you herbs to protect the lining of your stomach, to make sure you don't get ringing in the ears, which can happen with this particular herb that is good for nausea, but gives you ringing in the ears, right? So there's this constant balancing. Um, and Maria um, here, uh, our apothecarian, she's witness to my long, exhaustive formulas where I'm trying to figure out how to balance everything. So what I also want to talk about today is the establishment of a new institution, right? This is an apothecary. There were apothecaries all over the United States in the late 1800s. Now there aren't very many left, and it's a shame. But we have only had this very short time in history when we haven't had apothecaries all over the world. Actually, a very short time in history. But to cause culture change, right? Like what I'm trying to do and what other 
apothecarians are trying to do around the United States is they're trying to establish a new institution where people like you will come. You'll walk in and you'll come here instead of, um, you know, CVS or, um, you know, those acute emergency care places, that you'll walk in here and ask, ask us for help. And then we will develop for you a precise formula to help you with your condition. We'll also admit when we can't do anything about it. Um, that's our goal, um, to create that sort of culture and bring an ecological model of health and disease back. Now, when I was an undergraduate at UMass, I wrote a paper in 1989 called The Ecological Model of Health and Disease. And my professor, George R. Meligo, said, hey, you need, you need to publish this. This is pretty interesting. So even back there then, when I was interested in evolutionary biology, I discovered just through learning from my professors that actually, you know, we have evolved with plants. The way in which the mitochondria works in our body is friendly to plant medicine. The way in which um, the brain, the blood brain, brain barrier, can accept certain plants through its membranes is because of this evolutionary process that's gone on for millions of years. Um, and that's why now they're beginning to find out about it. It actually was only a few years ago that they found with hem the hemp plant, right, that there's the cannabinoid system that's just there waiting for the hemp and waiting to act as a sort of master control and solve a multi-layered problem in different organ systems with one plant with a cannabinoid system. Hope I said it right. I don't know. <laughs> so anyway, I'm talking about culture change. You know, and just to go back, that's 30 years ago that I was publishing papers and interested in that. And things haven't really changed that much, you know, I will say. Um, I did my PhD. I then went on and did a postdoc. I was an invited scholar at Harvard University with Herbert, Herbert Benson, and we did some interesting work about um, on the mental health of refugees in Tibet and northern India and treating Tibetan refugees. Gosh, imagine this with their own medical system. At the same time, the Doctors Without Borders were there treating them for PTSD and bringing in pharmaceuticals, right? So we were, in our paper, applying to protect Tibetan medical knowledge, protect Tibetan um, autonomy, you know, that Tibetans can heal their own. And certainly they can. And as we know now, you know, Tibetan medicine and Buddhism and yoga, all of this has really spread. So I'm hopeful that things are changing, you know. So that's the culture change. And so what I really want you to know is that there really is a crossroads of science and traditional herbal medicine in this apothecary um, that I'm very proud of, you know. So my intention today is that you walk away with a new effective option for pain relief. We're going to talk about this herbal pain formula that has really just flown off the shelves. Um, so many people want it. It's our biggest seller. It's our biggest seller. It's getting to the point, well, it got to the point that, you know, you can't make a gallon of a pain formula in a tiny place like this. You need to make it in an FDA and CGMC, CGMP compliant facility. Right. So that's what we're doing. Um, in about two weeks, the FDA, sort of the manufactured formula, is returned to us. Um, and we will have it here to sell. And it's a really groundbreaking formula that involves Chinese medicine, um, well, Native American medicine, um, but also a few Ay Ayurvedic ideas as well. Um, so I want to talk specifically about that herbal pain formula, the science of herbal medicine. I'm going to show you a video testimony of Moon Davis, um, and he was struggling with um, not wanting to get off OxyContin, and um, he did it with our pain formula. Um, and then at the very end, Jeff, Jeff Shaw over here, um, at the end of the talk I wanted Jeff to also tell you about his personal experience with pain. Um, and how the formula has helped him. Hello. 
This is a testimony for Dr. Ryan's pain formula. My name is Morningstar. My name is Moonlight. And this is our experience. Um, longer than I care to remember at the moment, um, I've been suffering with pain uh, to the point that um, uh, I had an operation last year, a major operation in my back. And after the operation, um, I was issued uh, oxycodone for some time, uh, six months maybe. Um, so the first five months or so, it seemed like it was helping. But the last month, um, it may, been, may be not have been necessary. But I didn't know it at the time. Um, Dr. Ryan's pain formula was introduced to me by my wife because she was concerned about my intake of oxycodone. Yeah, um, and his doctor had said that uh, he was at a kind of plateau where he might have to take more oxycodone and his pain might continue, and he was taking it three times a day. So he was really, I thought, dependent on the oxy. Um, oftentimes we as patients can't see what, uh, family members and doctors can see on the outside. Um, but I was introduced to, uh, Dr. Ryan's pain formula, uh, about three months ago. And, uh, immediately I, uh, stopped taking oxycodone and I haven't taken any since. And in fact, Dr. Ryan's pain for me has been so good to me that uh, I've even lessened the amount of that I take because I don't need it that often or that much. Mm -hmm. um, this is a formula that comes without side effects and without addictive addiction uh, in any way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm really thankful that I had an opportunity to try it. I would have never known how wonderful it was unless my wife showed it to me. Yeah, and um, also I think it, it helps one's mental abilities as well because with oxycodone, it seemed to affect the state of your mind. You know, being able to focus, being able to get motivated to do things was difficult. But I think being off the oxy, being using the pain formula when needed, um, it's, you've had a clearer mental state. So with that in mind, let us say to you that Dr. Ryan's pain formula has done a great, great service mm -hmm. to me. And I'm no longer dependent on oxycodone in any way, shape or form. And if you are in pain, maybe you should try Dr. Ryan's pain formula. Thank you. Thank you. Ryan. Yeah, so the opioid crisis. Now, I'll read this to you and you can read it yourself. This is a game changer. I was a heroin addict for over five years. In the closet, my whole day wrapped around how I was going to get more dope. After rehab, I had these incredible shooting pains in like the bones, the whole body shaking. It's called post-acute withdrawal or pause. It's the worst. I met Dr. Ryan at her apothecary and she referred me to rehab. I wanted to go an alternative route, but the law doesn't allow her, so I discovered. <laughs> so when I came back, she's saying, uh, she gave me this huge hug. She then said, I can help you with pain. Game changer. The pain went away. I had to take a lot of it, but I was able to like function without the shooting pains and shaking hands. I like it because it goes under the tongue and it works almost immediately. I'd like to see her get this out to the community. So what's interesting about this pain formula, and I'll talk about it later on, some of the science behind it, um, well, in the next slide, is that it's able to help people ease off opioids, and I'll show you why. So this is the striatum here, and this is, let's just call this, this is part of the dopamine system, all right? and. Um, so the striatum over here is responsible for, um, so it coordinates planning, 
motivation, reward. Um, it has a sort of reinforcement mechanism to it. Um, and it's also our social feel-good center. All right. In dysfunction, this area leads to addiction, bipolar disorder, autism, and actually Parkinson's disease. Now, the dopaminergic system that's connected to this striatum, see how it kind of flows through there and then extends up into the higher frontal lobe of the brain, the higher, higher centers in the brain, right? Um, this system, its pathways are about learning and also reward motivation, right? Because it's connected to the striatum, but it's, see how it's connected to the frontal lobe? So it might be, you know how if you, you've had children that went through the teen phase, they didn't quite have the frontal lobe, you know, but... Um, you know, so that's really awakening the frontal lobe there. Um, and the dopamine system also works with, um, it gives you that get up and go motivation. It gives you joy as well. You know, Wellbutrin works on the dopamine system and antidepressant. And Wellbutrin, you know, on people who are sort of lying in bed, they can't get out of bed. You know, Wellbutrin will give them back that get up and go feeling. And it works along this system. The pathways of the dopamine system, learning, reward and motivation. Um, neuroendocrine control. So when you have neuroendocrine diseases, and that is um, Parkinson's, um, the endocrine system, hormonal systemic problems, right? Um, uh, that sort of thing. In dysfunction, it causes Parkinson's, ADHD, addiction, restless leg syndrome, depression, as we talked about. So what's interesting is that in our herbal pain formula is that there is, there is a root, it's Corridalis root, um, and pharmaceutical companies and pharmacological researchers are very interested in it right now because it affects both the striatum and the dopaminergic system. And this root that's in our pain formula, not only does it help with pain, it also helps with stimulation of the dopaminergic system. And so if we go back to this woman who was a heroin addict, and we go back to Moon who was becoming an addict, and we go forward, what happens with this herb, it's called Yanhusuo or Corridalis root, what happens is that it attaches to the, um, the dopa, part of the dopaminergic system, the Yanhu Suo comes in, right, like a hand, and the dopaminergic system has sort of these areas where it can come in, and the active ingredient from the herb can come in and lock in and begin to awaken up that system. Because when you're an addict, the striatum here, what happens is that all your higher center functions shut down, and you go into a sort of, uh, sort of a um, lower survival um, reward mechanism system where actually you are rewarding yourself in this dysfunctionary, dysfunctional system, you're rewarding yourself for using. And your motivation is spending all day to get more dope. And it gets to the point actually that opioid addicts see heroin to be a good thing and very important to the point of water. If I do not take this, I will die. But when you have the pain formula, this was someone who took it obviously in post-acute withdrawal, right? So after she's gotten off the drugs. But she is taking the pain formula for the shakes and the you know, nerve pain, the fibromyalgia that can go on for a long time. Um, she's awakening the system, right? and she's helping the striatum develop healthy motivation and reward uh, behaviors. So positive outcome in chronic opioid, opioid addiction um, with Yan Hu Suo, all right? And here's the science, you know, this was in 2001, 2010, 2012. So as you can see, this herb for, you know, for a, nearly a decade, right, or a little bit over a decade, some studies, they have shown that ITHP, the active ingredient in Yanhu Suo, acts on the neurotransmitter DA in the central nervous system, and it is, an effect, it is effective in the treatment of opioid addiction. Manch et al., 
2010, found that in an animal model, right, of cocaine self-administration, this active ingredient in this herb did not inhibit the natural reward behavior mechanisms and decreased drug-induced self-administration behavior and relapse in rats. So um, what they're talking about is, if you go back, so something that happens in addiction is that the addiction inhibits this whole system here, dopaminergic system. It inhibits um, the re and, and stops um, opioid addicts from having joy from healthy, normal, rewarding activities, you know? Like folding laundry, shoveling the snow. No, just kidding. You know, rewarding <laughs> activities like, um, I hate doing laundry, um, but rewarding activities like painting, you know, or being with a friend, all of that um, is actually inhibited in the addiction. And so the inhibition goes away. The natural re reward mechanism, the natural reward mechanism begins to awaken again with Yan Husuo. And that's only one herb in this formula. I don't have time to go over the science over all of them, but this is the most interesting one for me. Um, okay, the antinociceptive effects of Yan Husuo, basically the ouchy effects, right, of um, Yan Husuo um, in acute inflammatory and neuropathic pain models. Now what's interesting about Yan Husuo, and this is Dr. Savelli, he's at UC California at Irvine, um, and he's chair of the department there in pharmacobiology. Um, what's interesting about this study is they found that it's amazing for neuropathic pain, and there are not many options for neuropathic pain pharmacologically, pharmacologically or herbally. So this is really interesting. Um, and this study was in 2016. So, number one, they're comparing morphine Yan Suo and ibuprofen to each other. Now, isn't that interesting? They're very interested in Yan Suo if they're spending thousands of dollars comparing it to morphine and ibuprofen, don't you think? Mm -hmm. I'm guessing. So, here's what you have. This is, these are markers of pain. It's, they're markers of the pain going away, all right? So the green is morphine, right? And this is like a three hour time period. And this is Yan Husuo in one certain dose, Yan Husuo in another dose, right? And this is the pain, the actual pain. They call it the vehicle. They're, they put that in the study, of course. Um, so, make a long story short, I didn't have ibuprofen on here. Anyway, so you take the morphine, right? And then you take the Yan Husuo. With the morphine, it shoots up and it's like, woo, baby, I ain't got no pain, I'm feeling great, right? So that's immediate, right? And then you see the Yan Husuo here. You're feeling pretty good, you know, and Jeff Shaw will talk about this later. Um, you're feeling pretty good. You're out of pain. Activities of daily living are coming back. Maybe you have some pain, right? But you're not on morphine and your head's clear, right? Not only that, what was interesting about this study is that Corridalis or Yan Husuo, what they found is that over time, and many studies followed after this that over time, Yan Husuo morphine, um, it works very quickly, but then it drops after, uh, you know, in two hours you're going to need more. And not only that, you're, uh, you become dependent upon it. And not only that, um, you become tolerant to it. So you've got to take more and more morph morphine or oxycodone or heroin, right? All the opioids. With Yan Husuo, what they found is that over time, it had a stabilized relief of pain. And not only that, no one built up a tolerance to Yan Husuo. So the um, amount that people need to take stays the same over time. And not only that, it is non-addictive. All right, why plant medicine? I'm going to tell you why. Because all of these plants here, every single one of them, were game changers in the pharmaceutical industry and they made the pharmaceutical industry billions and billions of dollars. And all of these herbal, all of these herbs came from complex, sophisticated and fascinating 
traditional herbal medica medical recipes, traditional indigenous medicine, all right? And these herbs, these herbal formulas that the pharmaceutical company used to develop their own biomedicines, they did not offer recognition to any of the indigenous medical healers that they plundered and stole these recipes from. So the Pacific yew tree, it produces the most important game-changing anti-cancer drug that's used in <coughs> colon cancer, breast cancer, and lung cancer today. Artemisia and artemisinin, the most important anti malarial drug used today. Galanthus nivalis, snowdrop plant, that's from the Inuit medicine, it's from Mongolian medicine. Um, cinchona bark, Native American medicine, very important uh, heart medicine, arrhythmia. Red yeast rice, oh, statins for cholesterol. Um, the mayapple, or the American mandrake, also an anti-cancer drug. Um, and I don't remember which one, pretty important. And Ma Huang, um, the anti asthmatics So what I want to talk about is um, the way in which we have Artemisia, Qing Hao, and hundreds of recipes from Chinese, Chinese, Mongolian, Tibetan, Taiwanese, Filipino medicine, versus artemisinin pharmaceutical uh, for, for malaria. So the artemisia plant, there are several um, formulas for malaria that come from artemisia, Ching Hao. And of course, you know, Merck Pharmaceuticals is using artemisinin, which has side effects. Um, but if you take the original formulas from Chinese medicine, Philippine, Vietn Vietnamese medicine for malaria, Right? Like I said before, they're taking care of the side effects um, that take place when you take large doses of artemisia. So, and what I think is interesting um, about especially the Asian medical traditions is that they are very old. <laughs> um, Dr. Chen Kang Chi in 710 AD, in the 6th century, wrote a book called Omissions from the Classic Materia Medica. Omissions from the Classical Materia Medica from the 5th century. Um, and also what's interesting about this is I attended a conference and that was in the year 2000 in Washington DC. And it was called the First International Congress on Tibetan Medicine in Washington DC. And His Holiness the Dalai Lama was there. And he got up to the microphone. And um, here's his microphone. It was really funny. And he said, Ah, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to tell everybody that actually, First International Congress, Tibetan medicine, 7th century. <laughs> the 7th century. And actually, in the 7th century, Chinese medical doctors traveled along the Silk Road to get to Tibet to this. Um, do you know Galen, the traditional um, Greek herbalist? His students, you know, probably a few generations down. Um, so Greek doctors made it to this international conference in medicine in the seventh century. So anyway, we're talking about, you know, herbal medical knowledge uh, that is very sophisticated, goes far back. Um, I have clinical case history books from the late 1800s to now. And um, it, it, it's so profound. I, you know, I, I'm very moved to be a part of, of Asian medicine. Um, okay, so National Institutes of Health. We'll soon stop talking about Yan Husu and we'll move on to other parts of the formula. But anyway, so these are more studies, right? Dr. Savelli's study I talked about, it's all, uh, so Yan Husuo, it's an analgesic, it's a sedative, it's anti-inflammatory, it's anti-ulcer, 
it's a muscle relaxant, and it awakens the dopaminergic system for those struggling to get off opioids. So here is our pain formula. So when I worked in the foothills of the Himalayas, Dr. Dadan would come to my tiny cabin and knock on the door at about 4 a.m. And she'd say, get up, you lazy bum. <laughs> and we would go and forage medicinal plants. Um, sometimes she'd wake me up in the middle of the night to deliver a baby. Sometimes she'd wake me up in the middle of the night to wash a dead body. Didn't matter. We were there to serve from morning till night. But what I loved was waking up and the fog and going out um, and foraging. It was fabulous. And then we'd end up at the clinic and we would finish work at about maybe 5 p.m. We'd smoke a little beady afterward. And then we would say the Medicine Buddha um, Puja, or we would chant and pray for all of our patients. And we'd also ask that all our faults not be evident and not be there in the clinic the next day. Um, and that we're sorry for any faults or any um, mistakes we've made today. And could we give it all to the Medicine Buddha. And could the Medicine Buddha solve anything that we've done that was wrong? You know, very humble, very true, very authentic, uh, very good people. Um, and also, Tibetan medical doctors take a vow that um, they do, do not turn anyone away who cannot pay. Um, so that's a bit different from Merck Pharmaceuticals, wouldn't you say? <laughs> okay, so in our formula you have Dong Kwai, you have Sila Root Fong Fong, Sichuan Lovage, Sayathala, all of these, right? Um, but what's interesting about the formula is that there are only three herbs for pain. All the other herbs are supports so that we don't um, imbalance your system. And here are the herbs that relieve pain. Sila root, Corydalis, Stefania root, Fang Fang, Yanhu Suo, Han Fan Ji. And um, they work in very different ways. Um, Fang Fang, actually it causes you to sweat um, contained in the interstitial fluid you know, surrounding all your muscular tissue and in the fascia are a lot of toxins, sort of mast cells, you know, inflammation built up that's just sort of hanging out there. Um, and in fact, all of us could use a little fang fang. And what it does is it sweats out um, uh, inflammation and toxins. Yan Hu Suo, as you saw. And then Han Fan Ji is a, an extremely violently strong analgesic as well. It's just pure pain. Um, and uh, I love it. And then these herbs that are in the formula, these are herbs that promote blood circulation. So in Chinese medicine, they want you, and Tibetan medicine as well, they want you when you're taking herbs for pain to make sure that those herbs are delivered to different systems. And it's interesting. So in the Chinese medical um, system, they have observed that some herbs will help with blood circulation, but also will help with blood circulation down to the feet. Some herbs will help with blood circulation to the extremities. Some will, blood circulation will deliver the pain herbs to the back. So we've incl included those herbs, trusting in the traditional way in which you pair blood, blood circulation herbs with pain herbs. And there's a holistic sort of synergy that happens here, you know. And I won't go into details. I want to make sure Jeff, you know, has time and we're moving on. But um, just to let you know, so here are the main pain herbs. We call those the chief herbs in the formula. The chief herbs are usually balanced by two herbs or so. Um, and we often add licorice into a formula because licorice, we say, harmonizes the formula. You always want to bring something sweet into a formula. And actually, if you think about it just practically, when we eat something sweet, we sort of want to eat it, you know, and it easily goes into, through the mucous membranes, etc. So sweetening a formula is nice. Um, another herb that's in this formula is mo yao, myrrh resin. And there's really interesting work going on right now um, with... Uh, with myrrh. And um, 
you can see the science here in 2017, 2017, 2015. It's very <coughs> new, but they're finding that all the resins, frankincense, pine resin, and myrrh, are fantastic pain relievers. And myrrh is fantastic for neuropathic pain, and that's why our formula helps with neuropathic pain. Um, helps with inflammation, um, and, and it's anti-inflammatory. Um, and helps with rheumatoid arthritis. So the future of medicine. You know, as, as we're coming to a close, I wanted to talk about the fact that um, I don't think that, I think we're still on the frontier of what plant medicine can do. Uh, plant medicine, it's ecological. Um, it's practical. It's less expensive. Um, it's not covered by insurance, but you can afford it, you know. Um, so anyway, I just want to tell you a brief story about nettles and to say, you know, this really taught me that we're on the frontier of something. And that is, nettles grows along the I-95 corridor. And interestingly enough, the Department of Highway for I-95 all along the corridor, they've been trying to get rid of nettles for years. And they do succeed. They develop um, pesticides. Um, but they have to keep changing the pesticides because the nettles evolve and they... Herbicides. Yeah, herbicides. Thank you. Um, developing herbicides. And um, it's fascinating to me that the nettles can evolve like that. And so they've got this hardy nettle species along the I-95 corridor. But then interestingly enough, um, a professor at the University of Maryland um, managed to get a certain section of I-95, I think it was in North Carolina, to study the nettles. I want to look at the nettles. Why are the nettles here, he asked. And in his study with the nettles, what he found was that the nettles possibly are the number one plant known, it's number one now, known for breaking down benzene in the air into harmless organic particles in the soil. So that's why the nettles are there. Of the because of the pollution of the traffic, yeah, so the benzene coming out of the cars. So, you know, we, I remember this professor said to me, you know, we don't know what we don't know. And we have to keep this open-heartedness. We have to keep this curiosity alive. You know, you, you talk to children, children know what they don't know, you know, and they're, and they're open-hearted and they're curious. I'll have patients come to me and they think they know maybe more than I do, which is fine, but they'll come in with the list of herbs that they want me to give them, you know, and they read it off the internet. And, you know, I say to them, okay, you know, um, <laughs> we could do that, you know. Um, and so there is this bias, you know, uh, with herbal medicine that hopefully we can overcome and you know, we can, through the science, you know, that we're seeing now, we can develop this curiosity and um, this enthusiasm for the future of plant medicine. So thank you so much for listening.